Hasanabi corporate? I don't even know what that is. All right, let's watch this. This is what I experienced minutes after setting foot in my family's hometown. We literally just got here. We went through the first military checkpoint and a bunch of soldiers stopped us, started yelling at us. I'm in the old city of Hebron in the occupied West Bank, a place that once bustled with life. But I'm about to see what Israel's occupation and settlers have done to the heart of this city. Yeah, that was a settler with a gun just firing, by the way. He won't go to jail. And to the people who live here. I don't know if there's TOS in this. I'm a little scared. I'm a Palestinian-American journalist, and I've spent much of my career reporting on the occupied territories. But Hebron, one of the West Bank's largest cities, is also my roots. My father was born and raised here. I've returned to learn how the occupation has decimated his beloved hometown, a place the amount of American Jews I've seen on Insta saying never again is happening again. These people are lost in the sauce, bro. Yeah, no, totally. Never again is happening again. They're not wrong. It's just, you know, Israel is doing it to Palestinians. Straight up. Place he hasn't been back to in years. I have a mixed feeling. Nostalgia with anger. Despair over despair. What can I say? I know it's really hard for him to see this. And so it's emotional for me. So we're officially on our way to Hebron. My team and I are going to Hebron's old city, which is ground zero of Israeli apartheid. Today, 33,000 Palestinians live in this part of Hebron, which is under full Israeli military control and fragmented by checkpoints, military outposts, and around 1,000. But can you imagine that's supposed to be your land? That's the marginal amount of land that they left for you? And then they slowly but surely, because this is not what it used to look like, slowly but surely over the course of the past couple of decades, literally partitioned your entire fucking state. They occupied it and they partitioned it. They put checkpoints everywhere. And Israeli settlers. Who but that's not what this is claiming. Wait, what? No, I thought he said it was Jordan, but that's not what this is claiming. Yeah, that guy was lying. He's talking about why Israel had to occupy the West Bank. He was going to get there, but I couldn't watch the rest of it because he literally said Jews were ethnically cleansed from the West Bank. That's so insane. We live here in violation of international law. But before we get into all of that, let me back up. It wasn't always like this. This is my dad. He was born in Hebron in 1947. He lived up the hill from the old city where his father and uncle owned a quarry. The year after my dad was born, Israel was established in what Palestinians refer to as the Nekba or catastrophe. That's because hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were expelled from their homes to clear the way for the creation of a Jewish state. If you asked Palestinians today if they would be fine taking back 17,000 uh, Jewish people that were expelled from the West Bank and Jordan in general, if they could go back to their own homes, but then there's a single state solution, that would have unified 100% support, okay? 100%. Because 800,000 Palestinians were purged. Fucking ridiculous. Not even a point of contention. And by the way, the people that are settling in the West Bank now are not those people. They're coming from America or inside of Israel where they are like the hyper, the ultra-nationalist hyper-Zionists who uh, are, are religious nutcases who think that it's like, God telling them that they have to put their ass over there and live there and, and and destroy the Palestinian communities there. What remains of the Palestinian communities there? Get the fuck out of here. But the West Bank, including Hebron, fell under the control of Jordan. My dad was 19 in June of 1967 when Israel captured the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights and began a military occupation that still has no end in sight. My dad was in college in Jordan at that time, so he wasn't in Hebron to witness that or to see how Jewish settlers took over parts of the old city. 
A few years later, he moved to the U.S. for graduate school. I was born and raised in San Francisco and grew up hearing my dad reminisce about his childhood, like how he raised chickens and rabbits on the hill as he watched the vibrant city below. When my family would travel to Palestine in the summers, my dad couldn't come because of work. Now, even though he's retired, he says he doesn't want to return because he refuses to be humiliated by Israeli soldiers. He's only been back to Hebron three times. But I'm returning to see with my own eyes what has become of this city that made my father and me who we are today. And that all begins with me actually getting there. It's only about 20 miles from Ramallah where we're starting out. But we can't, as Palestinians, access parts of the main north-south highway because that's reserved exclusively for cars with Israeli license plates. So here's another checkpoint. Instead, we have to take narrower roads and cross through several Israeli military checkpoints. There's another checkpoint. That means it takes much, much longer to get there. We're finally in Hebron. I'm sure my dad knows these streets inside and out, and he used to walk all over here as a child, so this is literally retracing his footsteps, but it's very different now than, than when he grew up. Today, many parts of the city are off limits to Palestinians. All right, gonna go through. Because I'm Palestinian, I'm not allowed to enter parts of the old city. So I'm meeting former Israeli soldiers who, I hope, will help me access my family's hometown. Hi, how are you, Ori? Yes. Nice to meet you, I'm Dina. Nice meet you. Ori and Joel are with the Israeli anti-occupation group Breaking the Silence. They used to serve in the Israeli army. But now they give tours of Hebron to expose the reality of how Israel treats Palestinians. Come, come here, come here, come here. But before they could even start showing me around, this happened. Bro, that's an American Palestinian. Remember, well, uh, they also fucking assassinated an American Palestinian journalist recently. So here, here, here are stars, baby. Here we go. My Palestinian film crew, who have the proper credentials, are sadly used to experiencing this kind of nationalistic harassment and taunting. So I've been in the old city for about five minutes and we were already stopped by... We literally just got here and a bunch of soldiers stopped us, started yelling at us started harassing my cameraman they just asked to see our ids i showed my u.s passport yeah that's not scripted at all nice script yeah dude yeah no the the all all of the all of the daily harassment that people in fucking uh people in the west bank experience from an occupying force is a script dog just a script or maybe it is so fucking commonplace that well first of all why the fuck would the idf participate in that even if it was a script <laughs> it's just a prank bro you you do you not realize both parties script a lot of this shit yeah dude yeah the idf staged this to make themselves look bad to all of a sudden have like six or seven armed israeli soldiers just swarm I mean, if you're saying they're fucking bots, if you're saying they're fucking bots and they behave like a goddamn, uh, if you're saying they're, they're bots and they behave like fucking bots, okay, you're right. You're right. From you, it's honestly really upsetting that this is how you get welcome to your own home city. The former soldiers I'm spending the day with say this is a typical scene. When you consider the fact that uh, they grew up in Israeli society, they have uh, education and uh, media and a political system, all of those elements are telling them that Arabs are scary, you know, Palestinians are bad. And then they get an opportunity when they're in the army, uh, they, they have power in their hands and it's not surprising that they use it. Finally, the soldiers give us back our IDs. Let's continue, right? The, it's, a, it's a very classic demonstration 
of one of the elements of the occupation, which is complete arbitrary, right? And every soldier in the occupied territories has the authority on his own decision to detain anyone for three hours. Yeah? Awesome. So we were not delayed here for three hours, and we are going to continue our tour, obviously, yeah, but, but it's but, an example. But what a way to start the day. I am about to learn that what I just experienced is nothing compared to what the Palestinians who live here go through every day. This is Fadl, who has lived in this home. Damn, another script, bro. <laughs> don't you guys, don't you guys realize this is another script? You know what I'm saying? Classic, classic scripted checkpoint. That's not even a real checkpoint, actually. His whole life. In the 1980s, Israel set up this checkpoint in front of his house. Fadl now has to check in every time he leaves or enters his own home. Fadl isn't alone. Thousands of other Palestinians in Hebron are also forced to pass military checkpoints just to go home. The military also bans Palestinians from using certain streets, as Ori shows me. On that street over there, Palestinians are allowed to walk and open businesses, but not allowed to drive. The yellow street on the map... Guys, remember, the entire world... And this isn't even like uh, pre-Nakba, like historic Palestine shit. This, at this point, is Israeli occupation that is universally, by the entire planet, according to the law, an illegal act. Okay? I need you to understand. This right here, this occupation is extra illegal. You might have a difference in agreement on, like, the Israeli state formation, but what they are doing here is objectively illegal. And also on top of that, it's in violation of multiple international laws. But also on top of that, it was maybe like two decades ago, not even official Israeli state policy. This is a, a Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, this is this is 100 uh, percent. The the one of the worst things that Benjamin Netanyahu did was like openly, slowly but surely change the attitude uh, in the Israeli government from like privately defending occupations in the West Bank to straight up colonizing the West Bank. This entire area, this entire area should be completely rid of idea of presence and no singular settler should be there. Okay? Not allowed. But because they know that it is completely and wholeheartedly illegal and it is a practice known as settler terrorism, they have to arm all the settlers they have to utilize the uh, the occupying force of the IDF to constantly maintain these checkpoints and shit. Because technically it would be legal and, and allowed to fight back against those settlers. That is an act of terror. According to international law, fighting back against those who live there right now, the settlers who came after, would be perfectly legal. 1,000%. Of course... Israel knows this, which is precisely the reason why, even if you look in the direction of a fucking settler, they will go in and they'll fucking harass you and they will arrest you. <sighs> it's a street where Palestinians are only allowed to walk, not allowed to drive and not allowed to open businesses. The streets that we're heading towards are mostly sterile, yeah? meaning that no Palestinian in the whole wide world can walk on those streets. If you do one step over here, no Palestinians are allowed here. If we take one step here, yeah, here Palestinians are allowed. And I don't know any other word to call this than apartheid. All these restrictions help Israel maintain its hold on Hebron. But they're also in place to protect Israeli settlers. And the ones in Hebron are known for being among the most yeah. violent in all of the occupied West 100%. Like, these are some of the most freakish uh of of the ultra zionist dude i remember a time i remember reading of a time when 
the Israeli government was conflicted at the very least, or at least the Israeli people were conflicted about these guys going and living in the West Bank because they were seen as freeloaders. They were seen as freeloaders who went and just fucking settled on this territory. Okay, bro, you can't call Israelis terror <laughs> terrorists. That's anti-Semitism. <laughs> Suck my dick. How do they tell who is Palestinian and who is not besides skin color? Great question. That is also part of the fucking reason why they have to have such rigorous checks and checkpoints and slap license uh, plate stickers on Palestinian cars because you can't tell who's, who, who is Israeli and who is not. You can't tell. That's why they have to do constant fucking ID checks. Settler terrorist, wild phrase, but it's the truth. Yes, this is considered by the international community to be an act of terror. By international law, what these guys are doing is an act of terrorism. It's called settler colonial terrorism. It demands this apartheid state, unlike uh, the apartheid state in South Africa, also demands round-the-clock surveillance. Now, of course, the apartheid state in South Africa also had round-the-clock surveillance as well, uh, and they had different methods of finding out exactly how not white you were. Like I, I said before, the, the, uh, the, the pencil test. Dude, name language for a start? Yes, language, but if you learn Hebrew, how the fuck are you going to distinguish that? And also, name? Nobody's name is on their fucking forehead. That's why they need identification and papers all the time. That's the point I'm trying to make. In apartheid South Africa... They used to have a, a, a test called the pencil st test where because miscegenation was illegal, uh, in order to figure out whether you were non-black, I mean, uh, non-white or not, they would stick a pencil in your hair. And if it's stuck in your hair, that meant you are not white. And therefore, you were not allowed in areas where only white people were allowed. That is how it works. There are, and, and this is, this is no different than, this is no different than the rigorous, the, the rigorous testing and the, the, the checkpoints that Palestinian people living in their own fucking land in West Bank have to go through on a daily basis. This is the peaceful collaborative project. Remember, this is the collaborative project. This is supposed to be what happens when you actually say, uh, uh, that you can coexist with Israel. This is what Israel does to you. Our uh, order in Hebron is protect the Jewish settlers, right? We don't have uh, an order protect Palestinians if, uh, if settlers harass The them. soldiers never protect the Palestinians. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not in our order. This is kind of a common sight here in the old city. Um, there's a Palestinian family that- Yeah, these are some of the most devout people. Don't they have an obligation to live their lives according to the religious laws, such as life is precious? Yes, uh, these are some of the most devout people. So, uh, one other thing I must explain to you, uh, chatters who are unfamiliar with this. If you live, if you live, if you're Palestinian living in the West Bank, okay, and you've lived there your whole life, if you leave- for any reason, you are not allowed back in to the West Bank. You're not allowed in. Because the Israeli state's official policy is forcible displacement, ethnic cleansing. That lives at the end of this alleyway. Above them is an Israeli settlement. And because the settlers throw garbage down at them, they have to put these nets here to protect them. <coughs> He was arrested. The family at the end of the alley is the Siddhars. Just a few weeks before I arrived to Hebron, nearby settlers accused their 13-year-old daughter Selwa of picking a knife up off the ground. <laughs> Liar! You have the knife! A lot of this stuff is... It, 
for the record, a lot of this stuff is very well documented. You can you can see it. I mean, they they film it. Everybody's got cameras. You know what I mean? I mean, you might not be able to see it at the top of the hour when there's a three minute ad break. Maybe this is why they weren't prepared for the attack because they were too busy bothering kids. No, unironically, that is part of it. Yes. With Bengivir, who is a Kahanist terrorist dog, okay, um, uh, given the, the uh, West Bank territory and its interior security, he wanted to move. He wanted to move more security forces, more occupying forces in the West Bank so that they could keep killing the, 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 the Palestinians that live there and, and deal with the inevitable backlash that happens in that circumstance. Aisha Esquire, thank you for the five get the subs. This is part of the reason why, this is part of the reason why uh, they did not have enough uh, in, interior, uh, they did not have enough resources internally to defend the southern areas. Oh, another fun fact, obviously, of course, the IDF uh, trains the American police force post 9-11. So, you know, just remember that. Remember this insane Harvard professor spewing? You will say, what? You want us to make you look good? That's not my job. Your job is to make us look good. Our job is not to make you look good, American Jews. What do you have to worry about? Your job is to make us look good. And here's how you do it. Every one of us has to serve three years in the army, two years in the army, some of us five years, and then for the rest of our lives, you have got to serve two or three years in the army of words. You've got to learn to fight the political battle which is even more important at this point than the military battle that we are. We'll fight the military battle. We're not asking you necessarily to come and be lone soldiers, although some of you can. You've got to learn how to fight back on the campuses, how to make the arguments. Now, they keep shifting. It's pretty funny because, like, in spite of all of that, uh, Israel has, <laughs> unfortunately for Hasbara trolls, uh, Israel's actions speak for itself. And if it wasn't for the mainstream media constantly carrying all of the fucking uh, burden of manipulating people and refusing to cover the real situation on the ground, when you come into a community like this, you hear their arguments. It's fucking bullshit. You cannot argue against the cruelty of an apartheid state. You can cry and piss and shit your pants and say the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and former Mossad and, and, and former prime ministers of Israel and, and all these fucking people are actually secretly anti-Semitic for calling Israel an apartheid state. You can do all of that, but the truth will still prevail when you say, when you say we're cutting off the fucking food and the water and the electricity to the world's largest concentration camp operated by Israel, open-air concentration camp, when you say that, or when you, when you openly show that that's what you're doing, it's impossible to argue against. You can say, oh, well, the Hamas did it, and Hamas, Hamas is the responsible, Hamas is responsible, but it's like, okay, on this part of the planet, there is no Hamas. You think this little girl is Hamas? This is the West Bank. This is supposed to be untouched, untarnished Palestinian territory. So what the fuck is IDF doing there to this little girl? You know, it, 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 the, the ground keeps shifting under us. They keep changing the language. Interesting. The ground doesn't keep shifting. What keeps shifting is Israel's violent actions, uh, which become increasingly more violent. And that is by design. It's not because, like, it is, it is the inevitable conclusion of any fascist ideology. Any fascist ideology inevitably has to keep squeezing and squeezing and squeezing and keep making more violent actions the reality. That's how it works. You have to keep cranking the dial slowly but surely and, and become more violent. 
Violence is a necessity for any state development, of course, but additional violence that even most human beings will comprehend as violent outside of the norm violence is a necessity for the maintenance of an apartheid state. Direct violence in the form of annexation, constant military uh, presence, a surveillance state. These are all necessities for the maintenance of, a, uh, of an apartheid state, and Israel certainly is one. It's not grandma's fault. Well, I guess it is, kind of. <laughs> grandma's justifying it, so she, she's willingly a participant of it. But ultimately, this is a reality that everyone has to reckon with. This is a reality that, that people who are participating in this apartheid regime have to reckon with. These problems will not simply go away. They will not perish. Intersectionality wasn't even a word 10 years ago. Now suddenly it's intersectionality. You've got to stay on top of it. And you know how we train for the army? We don't train for defensive warfare. If the, if the war against Israel, yeah, Israel ever had to be fought on Israeli soil, do I have to tell you? It's, it, it's an impossibility. So it's the same thing. Don't let the war of words ever be fought about Israel's nature. Let it be fought about why you can't accept Israel. Why you have to single out this tiny people. Bro, she literally is being like, she's like, yeah, just say everyone is anti-Semitic. <laughs> Try to find Israel on the map. It's hardly there. You know, we used to play this game, where's Waldo? Everything you say about Israel, you can say tenfold for Palestine. Try to find Palestinians on the map. You literally can't. Israel wiped it, okay? Why do you care so much about Palestinians trying to survive? You know, uh, you know there's, where is Waldo on the map? Are you going to really tell me that this is the country you want to blame? Push them. Teach them how to defend by attacking. Teach them, really, what one says as in fencing. Oh, yeah, by the way, she is a Harvard uh, professor, tenured Harvard you've professor. You've got to do that. You've got to make demands on them. They've got to serve for three years in the army of words. <laughs> well, I, uh, I, uh, I cannot even start uh, with this. Uh, to compete with this question and... Well, thanks. Thanks, lady. Anyway, let's get back to a uh, peaceful coexistence project in the West Bank with uh, under the Israeli occupation. This is the, the daily realities of Palestinians living in their own fucking homes in their own neighborhoods. <laughs> So we're standing here and I'm talking to her in front of her home and every time we hear a noise she looks up and I asked her are you afraid the settlers are throwing something down at you and she said yeah Look at that Effective propaganda is this little girl you know I bet she. I bet she actually scripted that. Um, you know that Gestapo uh, stopping her, just so she could film it on a phone camera and show the world how fucked up the IDF is. It's just like they keep pushing us to to do fucked up shit. It's fucked up. Scripted. <laughs> Just talking to her, it's really you don't feel safe at all. Like it's not it's not a life that people should or can accept. So how did Hebron end up feeling like a prison for its people? After the Israeli occupation began in 1967, Hebron was among the first places Jewish settlements were built. This illegal land grab captured international attention. Now there's pressure for large-scale Jewish resettlement. 
and to some people this looks very much like colonization. Some settlers said they were coming to Hebron because of its sacred place in Judaism, as the burial site of Prophet Abraham and his family. Others said they moved there in response to a massacre of Jews that happened in 1929. That's when rising tensions over European Jewish immigration aimed at turning Palestine into a Jewish state led to violence. More than 60 Jews were killed and homes and synagogues were destroyed in the ancient city. But even after the settlers moved in, Hebron streets weren't segregated. Then, in 1994, everything changed. An American Israeli settler armed with an assault rifle. It was Baruch Goldstein's a piece of shit uh, uh, ass that uh, that uh, Ben Gavir had a photo of, right? It was him, right? Piece of shit. Just wait. Just wait. For those of you who do not know who this man is and what he did, it is the it is the archetype of what I talk about regularly. Rifle entered the Ibrahimi Mosque during Ramadan and killed 29 Palestinians. Palestinian fury as the victims of the mosque massacre are rushed to hospital in Hebron. Doctors say most were shot in the back as they knelt to pray. The shooter was ultimately overpowered by survivors and killed. But today, many Israelis in nearby settlements continue to honor him. In response to... Yeah, by the way, yeah, they honor him, bro. They honor him. Ben Gavir had a photo of him in his fucking house, bro. Once again, Ben Gavir, too extreme for the Israeli military. Ben Gavir could not serve in the IDF because he was a Kahanist terrorist dog, okay? Like, understand this. Understand where Israel is now politically, okay? Oh, wow. Oh, shit. They, ben Gavir responds to Bennett. Fine, I'll take down the Baruch Goldstein picture. So he reluctantly had to take down the photo. What are you doing? Yeah, it is. It is like being like, oh, man. <laughs> oh, fuck. You really want me to take down the fucking photo of the mosque shooter, the Christchurch guy? Shit, dude. Uh, I guess. To this massacre and the unrest that followed, Israel punished the victims, closing off roads and choking the economic lifeblood of this Palestinian city. You know, we're just seeing so many. Yeah. And, and by the way, Baruch Goldstein won. He fucking won. He, he got his goal across. He accomplished his goal. Like what? There is no world in which like the people that are occupied get punished after uh, uh, after a, a terror attack after they withstand a terror attack. Like that's insane. But of course, there is no logic in apartheid. It's always fuck the underclass. Empty houses, empty storefronts, Israeli flags everywhere, soldiers stationed everywhere checking us. Since the crackdown, over 1,500 Palestinian-owned shops have closed for good, and more than 1,000 Palestinian families have moved away from Hebron city center. They have decimated the old city Israel has. And it's really unfortunate to see. I mean, this should be a thriving, bustling marketplace. Oh, for people asking who the fuck... Uh, ben Gavir is he is the the uh, the minister of national security, and then Yahoo gave him a fucking SS Praetorian guard, Itamar Ben Gavir, with his very own Praetorian guard. He recently was in the news again because everyone is yelling at him. Everyone is yelling at him. Uh, no, he's not the one who uh, asked to cut the power. Okay, no, there are plenty of demons in uh, in the Israeli government, brother. No, <laughs> Ben Gavir is not the one uh, who asked to cut the power. That's the head of the military. That one is also a psychopath. But uh, Itamar Ben Gavir is the is the right wing Kahanist terrorist extremist who was too extreme for the IDF. They would not let him serve uh, in the military. Uh, he is a fan of Baruch Goldstein, uh, who who wounded 125 worshippers and killed 29 in Hebron, as you saw. NBC News, U.S. officials, Biden urged Netanyahu to reduce civilian casualties in the Gaza Strip. This is the very latest news, Lamont. Why, why would they? Why would they? America lets you do anything. 10% of Israeli Jews thinks he's a, think he's a national hero. For the record, 
just want to point something out here once again. This is like, this is too extreme for most Israelis. Like, there you go. 57% of Jewish Israelis polled said they thought Goldstein was a terrorist. Well, about a third of the respondents did not know whether to regard him as a terrorist or a national hero. It's varying degrees of Zionism in Israel. It's like from the most liberal all the way to the most reactionary. It only goes to the right for the most part. But, oh, this is what I was going to show you. Ben Gavir says 10,000 assault rifles purchased for civilian security teams. These are guns, helmets, and body armor to be distributed to hundreds of residents of border regions, mixed Jewish Arab cities, and West Bank settlements. That was his, that's what he's doing. Israel also, uh, a while back, uh, implemented a very interesting border patrol policy where they put bounties where they put bounties on on civilians to go out and capture undocumented citizens. It was so well received by Americans that Tucker Carlson said we should do it in America. Yeah. Doesn't America already do bounty hunters? No, this is specifically so you can forcibly detain and be uh, rewarded by the government for detaining uh, people you suspect are undocumented place right now and it's completely empty look at these empty homes used to be the prime real estate in the west bank Here, her, oh, she's, harass, she's, 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 she's harassing a palestinian right now just because so he's sweeping what she, he's what, sweeping what we can just see here the palestinian cleaning the street they just uh, tried to clean around the military post to do their job yeah because this is still a street where palestinians are allowed to walk and this settler uh, uh, woman told them this settler woman told them that uh, they, they, they shouldn't enter, they shouldn't enter there, they, should, they cannot enter this, even though it's a military post. Don't, please don't touch our camera. That's wild. The settler woman got mad at the Palestinian for sweeping the street, and then she attacked us and our cameras and tried to block us from filming. Many of Hebron's settlers moved here from the United States. Sadio came from Brooklyn a few years ago. Does it bother you that you're living somewhere so heavily militarized where Palestinians that have been here for generations are getting kicked out of their houses and can't walk on certain streets? So um, I'll ignore the use of the term Palestinian since there is no such nation or people. Uh, it's Dog, you're from Brooklyn. Shut the fuck up. You're from Brooklyn. Oh, my God. I'm going to lose my mind. Oh, my God. 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 It's so hard. It's. I knew, I knew there was going to come a point in the fucking conversation where they were going to talk to a fucking American settler and I was going to lose my fucking mind. It's always a guy, dude. There's always a dude. There's always a fucking disgusting American pervert there who's like, oh, sorry, dog. Like, fuck, this is my city now. <laughs> oh, I don't, I, don't, I don't care that, like, uh, your family supposedly lived here for hundreds of years, okay? <laughs> hey. Uh, we're manifesting destiny so hard that we're manifesting it here, dude, in fucking Israel, my boy. It doesn't mm -hmm. bother me at all. Uh, militarization is a thing happening all across the world. I'm not up to anything and nobody's... Uh, uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like militarization happening everywhere, bro. This is how all states are formed. It's like, yes, but not in front of our eyes. You know what I mean? Invading my space for no reason, I don't care. Yeah, you can't do shit too. They'll spit on you. They're fucking gross as shit. They'll beat you up. Now they have more guns than they ever did before. I, the IDF is there to literally defend them. They spit on you and then you get arrested. Uh, yeah. Once again, want to point out, this is not Gaza. This is when you... This is not Gaza. Gaza is even worse than this. Gaza is what happens when you don't cooperate with Israel. This is what happens when you do cooperate with Israel. I need you to understand... This is the West Bank. This is where this is where Israel should not even have the IDF positions. And yet for some reason, year over year, they have developed directly inside of Palestinian towns and have put highways 
directly in between Palestinian towns, put checkpoints directly in between Palestinian towns, and then slowly but surely turned most villages into fucking parking lots so that people can get cheap and free real estate. So why do you give these tours? It's extremely important to show people what the occupation looks like because this word is very vague for most people, right? How do we know a one-state solution wouldn't lead to the, lead to the same race as society? Um, there's a couple different reasons because... There's a fuck ton of Palestinians. That's part of the reason why one state is like not even discussed. And people consider that to be ethnic cleansing of Israeli Jews because there's a lot of Palestinians. So if there was a democratic process, um, you know, there, if there was a democratic process, they're worried that like Palestinians would have rights and, and therefore could stop this kind of partitioning from happening. But make no mistake even when there were significantly less jews there still were uh jewish people and christian people and muslim people peacefully coexisting in historic palestine of course before the nakba and before the british occupation british mandate this is you know the moment this stream died busty jewish boy what palestinians would roughly be 28 percent of an integrated population 4 million versus 10 million that is, of course, if Palestinians got the same liberties that Israelis have currently or Jews have currently to be able to freely uh, to, to freely immigrate into Israel, because obviously one of the goals is to, you know, maintain a, a if Palestinians have a right to return, then that number would even be larger than that. Yeah, there are four million Palestinians in Palestine. OK, two and two. In, in Gaza, in the West Bank, I think the, those numbers are right. And then there are 5 million in diaspora displaced. More Palestinians are displaced from their ancestral homes than living in uh, Gaza or the West Bank. So it would most likely be a 50-50 split. 9 million, uh, well, I guess it wouldn't be 9 million Jews because the Israeli population also has uh, Palestinian uh, or Muslim Israelis as well. Uh, the 1948ers, the ones that actually did get <laughs> the the first and last time uh, Arabs were given, Muslim Arabs were given uh, first and last time that Muslim Arabs were ever given citizenship. So, yeah, they would be, uh, while they are second class citizens now, I think if Palestinians had a right to return in a, in a single state solution, the uh, Muslim number would be larger like the number of, of uh, Palestinians would be larger, which is, I think, what they are afraid of for the most part. I think ghettoization is a better term than saying partitioning. Ghettoization is stage eight of genocide. Yeah, this is, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, okay, then Gaza is a concentration camp. If this is a ghetto, then Gaza is a concentration camp. Gaza is not the ghetto. This is uh, the ghettoization. Occupation. And... When you see here, when you walk on those segregated streets, you cannot ignore the reality. But yeah, now you understand why the single state solution is not uh, likely, because Israelis would never allow that to happen. And, and for the record, that would not yield a fucking uh, genocide of the Jews or anything, okay? Because Palestinians just want to exist freely in their homes, okay? Without constantly having to struggle with an occupying force, bullying them, humiliating them, killing them, arresting them for no reason whatsoever as second class citizens in their own fucking neighborhoods. Um, the idea, the idea that this would like uh, flip the script and that Palestinians somehow would treat Israelis in the same way that Israelis treated them is pure fantasy. It's a hypothetical. It is pure projection. It is no different than when racist white Americans think that when the, the white majority turns into a white minority, that the minorities will treat them with the same fucking viciousness that they showed other people, that they showed the minorities themselves. It's the same attitude that slavers had in the Reconstruction era, that we must restore the social hierarchy between black and white people in the Reconstruction South because otherwise they'll fucking kill us. They'll kill us. They'll treat us. They'll enslave us. Most of these people who have been oppressed are not looking for vengeance. 
Okay, they're looking for equality. And I believe that it's my responsibility as someone who, who took, it, took part in it. The minimum that I can do is to try and show people what I was sent to do. I believe that any decent human being who will see this will want this to end. So we're going to attempt to enter Shuhada Street right now. Um, no Palestinians are allowed to be on that street, only Israelis and foreigners. I'm going to enter on my U.S. passport. Of course, I'm originally Palestinian, so we'll see how that goes. While all of Hebron's old city has been affected by the occupation, the most striking example might be Shuhada Street. It used to be the city's most important, vibrant thoroughfare. My dad went to middle school. Yeah, one state solution is a confederation of two states with self-autonomy and national parliament that has 50-50 Israeli, Jewish, and Palestinian Muslim Christian representation like Lebanon. Reparations for Palestinians and free access to holy sites for all three religions would be the, the right thing to do. I, I don't even think that it should be a 50-50. A, a uh, I don't even think that it should be a confederation of two states with self-autonomy. I think it should be a singular state. ...school on this road, and his family owned shops here. But in the years following the 1994 massacre, Palestinians have been banned from walking on this street, even if they live on it. So the Israeli military welded these Palestinian doors shut. See? This is welded. We actually welded shut their doors. We sent Israeli soldiers to weld shut those front doors uh, of these families, while everyone else who is not a Palestinian can walk freely. This video shows what it takes for one Palestinian woman to leave her home. She climbs her roof and scales back down to the ground to exit on a back street where she is allowed to be. But if you're a Jewish settler, you can walk out in the front, in your front uh, of your look at front us. door. Yeah. Look at us. Not only if you're a Jewish settler. Everyone who is not a Palestinian. the last time I went to the street? I think it's been 25 years. 25 years? I mean, every day you come to it and it's banned. No, this is worse than Jim Crow South. I'll, I'll say that. I'll 100% say that. I've actually said it before. Jim Crow South is what is what Arab Israelis experience inside of the borders of Israel right now. This is so much worse. Like, it, it's true. It, it's, it's like, Jim, it, not to say that the Jim Crow South was like, great. Obviously it wasn't. It was devastating, right? But it would be a step up from the West Bank and multiple steps up from Gaza. It's not even comparable. This is the old central bus station in Hebron, and they've turned it into a new military base that's under construction there, and behind it is a new settlement. Over here, we can walk and have a look on the old Julia. That's why Noam Chomsky says that the situation with uh, Israel's apartheid statehood is worse than the apartheid state of South Africa because the South African population was 90% black, 10% white, and the apartheid also had an additional materialist uh, reason for its existence where you could basically enslave black people and, uh, and black people made up, comprised uh, the, the entirety of the workforce. Whereas inside of, of Israel, uh, there are different factions and, and different, different understandings, but um, there are plenty of people who do not think that uh, that, that there is any use for Palestinians whatsoever and that they should just simply go away. Military markets. This whole thing is a settlement. This is how absolutely devastated it is right now. Settlers came and just ravaged the whole place and destroyed it. This is the old fruit and vegetable market. It was here and now, now what does the sign say, Ori? Now this is a settlement. The old city has suffered everywhere you look. There's just deserted shops, deserted homes, destruction, broken windows. And in the middle of it all, there's like schools and, and settlements and Israeli settlers just living their lives with the full protection of the military. You know, one thing that's really striking being here is how incredibly silent it is. The only sound you hear is the flutter of these little Israeli flags above. I keep thinking about how 
you know, I directly descend from here. Not only is it like sad on just a human level, but there's a very personal element to this street as well. I don't blame my dad for not wanting to come back because it's that messed up. So I'm trying to piece together exactly where my dad grew up. You know, I've pieced together that that's where my family's home is. And the view is of a bunch of Israeli flags and a military outpost on the, on the hill over there. And in between them, the cemetery where my grandparents are buried and the home We're that my pee, father grew up in. So, man, I wonder if he's awake right now. I should FaceTime him. Hi, Baba. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good How are you? Oh, I'm fine. I want to show you. I think this is where you grew up. Is this? This is Shohada Street. Uh, yes. Yeah, this is Shohada. There's nobody here except for some soldiers and a few settlers. It's a total ghost town. During the days, you see the people in the market, and, uh, and at night, I could see the singing and the dancing. It was like the, the heart of the city. Sad. So sad. It's so sad. Uh, um, I had a mixed feeling, uh, nostalgia with anger. This is the old vegetable market. Does this look familiar to you? Exactly. I used to go sometimes in the morning in the summer to buy cactus pear. This is uh, despair over despair. What can I say? How does it make you feel uh, showing your dad? I don't know. I feel really sad. Like, he grew up right there. You know, his parents are buried right there. and. I know it's really hard for him to see this, and so it's emotional for me. My dad wanted to talk to Ori. Uh, hello, my friend. Hi, hi, <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm glad you are for uh, uh, peace. <laughs> we come to good people like you to um, expose uh, the lie. I really hope you can be here and visit your childhood uh, uh, home. Listen, this is why, like, uh, I also don't have the same fucking perspective that many others have about veterans in general, because even if you were duped into service, even if you, well, and in Israel, it's even more different than that because there's a dra uh, there is a forcible conscription, right? Um, ultimately you have one, uh, always the, the, the service is mandatory in Israel, but you always have the opportunity to also go to jail, but that's a, that's a big ask. Especially when you consider that, um, especially when you consider that, um, you don't even think about that alternative, okay? No, don't say you still participated in this shit, man. If you are an actual fucking leftist, you should literally understand reform, okay? By heart, rehabilitation by heart. If you spend your, uh, if you spend the rest of your life making up for what you have done, okay, after being full-blown propagandized your whole fucking life, and then you served in the military because it's mandatory, okay, and, and then you literally join a fucking group of veterans, specifically, which I've, I've also utilized uh, uh, as well in my coverage here, and you fight, uh, and you fight against the occupation, which is the veterans group that he's a part of, uh, the IDF Veterans Against Occupation, it's perfectly valid. What are you supporting here? What's your POV? Is it common for all former IDF soldiers to go against the state and support Palestine after they serve? Fuck no. Uh, no, of course it's not. I see the exact same uh, situation in America as well. Heavily propagandized group of individuals. If you, if you served in the military... Uh, due to the poverty draft or due to some hoorah dipshit post 9-11 and then you recognize that that sucks i mean i've had mike preisner on the stream he is a fucking american u.s military veteran also a member of uh, psl he's awesome he is married to uh to to abby martin whose documentary we watched yesterday gaza fights for freedom there are plenty of wonderful people who may have done bad things in the past it's all a matter of perspective and it's all a matter of, of recognizing what that service entailed and then working to right those wrongs. I mean, yes, one of the best members of this community, of course, is Chelsea Manning, also a veteran of the U.S. military. She not only paid a very big price for her bravery, but there are still, she is living proof that there are still incredibly crying, incredibly brave 
uh, individuals that, that serve for one reason or another and then recognize that what they're doing is wrong and work against it. Uh, at some point, really, really hope. You know what I do? <laughs> I just keep looking at the pictures over and over and over again. I am uh, physically in San Francisco, but spiritually and emotionally always in Hebrew. I'm curious, how did, how did you feel watching me talk to my dad and then speaking to him yourself? Like I said, responsible, that this is what the place that I grew up in, that I was so proud of when I was a child. This is what we're actually doing to people. And it feels uh, horrible to feel that. What most haunts you and your conscience about what you did in your time as a soldier? For me, it's the routine way we control the Palestinians, right? A Palestinian can wake up in the morning and not know if he will be at work on time, go to sleep, not know if soldiers will invade his home. We basically control the most simple and basic elements of life. It's designed to break down the population of Palestinians and show them who's in charge and yeah, humiliate we, them on a daily basis. Exactly. How, how can we make 2.5 million Palestinians in the West Bank to feel that they cannot lift their head up? we will make them uh, understand that we control their lives like do you see this is why this is this right here when the entire state tells you that this is normal and good it takes a lot of bravery to and it takes a lot of self-criticism to be able to like snap out of your your daily life and everything that you've learned and be able to rewire yourself and go against your programming that's why it's. I don't have the same perspective that many others do, I think, when it comes to uh, veterans. The segregated roads and the settlements are so and so forth, they exist all around the occupied territories. And military activity, home invasions, patrols, digital surveillance, they exist here and they exist all over the West Bank. The difference in Hebron is that in a very short walk, we can see examples of all of it. All of it. All of we it. We saw all of it. It was a heavy day, but before it ended, I wanted to visit my father's childhood home. As I stood on the roof overlooking the old city, I thought about how the landscape today is completely different from the one he looked out at when he stood in the same spot. And I couldn't stop thinking about everyone I met and the price they're paying for remaining. <laughs> Yeah, by the way, this is why people say Palestinians are the most resilient people in the world. Because in the face of all this oppression, they say, no, we're going to keep, we're going to keep living our lives. But I want my daughter to be strong. Once again, peaceful coexistence project in the West Bank, run by the Palestinian Authority. This is important for you to recognize. And the situation has only worsened since this documentary came out 11 months ago. The reason why you have to see this is because Gaza feels so alien. It feels so foreign to people. Gaza feels like Iraq. Americans are so conditioned into thinking like death, destruction befalls upon the Middle East, on the Muslim people. They're barbarians. They deserve it. They're violent. So you look at Gaza and you think, oh, this is just like Baghdad when we bombed it. The reason why I wanted you to see this is because these people are not Hamas. People in Gaza are not Hamas either. But Israel can't even claim that these people in West Bank are Hamas. This is yet, this is an even larger uh, uh, 
act of of maybe not evil but disrespect this is their home and they are trying by way of the Palestinian Authority of, or have tried by way of the Palestinian Authority to collaborate with the Israeli government not the people uh, not the people on the ground of course they have different opinions but the, the, the understanding is that this is what it looks like to live and collaborate alongside uh, uh, the, the Israeli government. So this is why I always say when people say like, oh, dude, if, if Israel stopped its violence, like uh, they, would, uh, they would be ethnically cleansed. If, if uh, Palestinians stopped its violence, like all the violence would end. It's bullshit. <laughs> It's hard to shake the idea that this Palestinian father could have been my dad. I could have been Selwa. This could have been my life. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this video from... And 100%, like I said, people that are not supposed to be there but live there, the Israeli settlers, are engaging in an act of terrorism. Okay? It's called... Settler terrorism. This is not just my opinion on the matter. This is international law. Not that it fucking matters. Those settlers are engaging in an illegal act. It is well within the legal rights of the Palestinians to engage in armed resistance against them. Israel knows this, and that is precisely why they control that territory in the way that they do. They're calling you Hamas poker now, Sag. You can only do so much. Oh no. A bunch of fucking antisocial personality disordered losers on online that never go outside, that just make memes simply about whatever fucking new trend is out there are calling me Hamas Abi or Hamas Piker. Oh no, what will I do? What will I do? <laughs> okay. They're losers, man. What are you going to do? Those people will never know a day of happiness. Yeah. Hamas Abi. I know.